welcome to today's meeting. It is on Frantz Fanon and it is called Imperialism and Revolution, Who Was Frantz Fanon? So my name is Saba, I'm a member of the SWP in Ealing and the way the meeting is going to run today is Gary is our speaker, he is a campaigner in the, he was a campaigner in the Black Lives Matter movement and also a campaigner in the uh, movement for uh, the victims of the Grenfell Tower incident. So he's going to speak for 35 minutes and then there will be plenty of time for discussion where you guys will be able to ask questions and make any points that you'd like and then Gary will sum up after that. So over to you Gary. All right, um, is that working okay? Yeah. Uh, Franz Fanon, why um, are we talking about him today? Um, he died back in 61. Um, a philosopher, a psychiatrist, and above all, a revolutionary. And many of his ideas were concerned with how we can overcome and overthrow imperialism and racism. Um, and those two things are very much still with us today. Um, and rereading Fanon, um, as I've done, um, not shocked, but um, pleased by the prescience of many of his uh, ideas um, and uh, the, the relevance of those ideas today. Um, in particular, his critique of national liberation movements um, and his prediction but although the victories were welcomed against the uh, European colonialists, there were problems. Um, these problems might come to fruition in the newly independent states. Um, the question uh, what we now call Islamophobia, for example, Fanon dealt with brilliantly in his writings on uh, Algeria and French imperialism. Um, so Fanon has become very popular. Uh, in places like this, or the, the colleges around places like this. Um, and uh, that might be one reason for his popularity. But I think first and foremost, his ideas, as I say, actually relate to where we are today. Um, and Fanon's position in space and time, um, not outer space, but his geographical position, um, um, and the time when he lived, actually also impacted on uh, his uh, uh, ability to give us some insights in how a revolution might unfold and how racism might be destroyed. Um, and also where he was coming from, his trajectory, and how his ideas were developing at that time. Um, so, who was Franz Fanon? Um, won't do a, all the biographical detail, so I'm sure comrades can read that for themselves. But suffice to say, he was from a middle class background on an island called Martinique in the French Caribbean. Um, and um, I came to Franz Fanon through the Black Panther Party, who were very heavily influenced by his ideas. Um, but I didn't really know much about Fanon beyond what he said about violence and its cleansing um, ability for the oppressed and to show to the oppressor that we are not inferior and that we can take you on. Um, and that certainly appealed to the Panthers. But I didn't really know much more beyond that. But as you look at his... Um, his history um, is, is quite, uh, becomes quite apparent um, how his ideas developed in a particular social and uh, geographical context, the context of colonialism um, in the Caribbean. And uh, Martinique is still today, to this day a part of France, supposedly. Um, I need to go and actually read some more about what's, uh, what happened in uh, the French colonies in the Caribbean, because um, my, my reading has been concentrated on uh, the Black Jacobins and uh, the story of San Domingo and that, that, that massive and successful uh, slave revolt. Um, but I don't know much, too much about Martinique or Guadeloupe, which I shall, I shall go and try and discover some more. But anyway, that's where he was from, and he came from a, a say, middle-class background, went to a lycée. Um, my French is rubbish, so forgive my pronunciations, even though I went to a post school, I didn't really do French. Uh, um, and um, so he went to a grammar school, let's call it. Um, and uh, he had the idea that, yes, the, uh, the Beke, the, uh, the uh, descendants of the slaveholders in Martinique, were horrible people. He knew that to be the case. But he had this idea that France is surely different, but surely in France proper, in the metro metropolis, they still believed in the idea of liberty, equality, fraternity, and still practiced that to some extent. Um, those illusions would be blown away. Um, so he's around in the... Um, 
as the world, world War II breaks out and manages to get out of, uh, Guad, or out of Martinique um, and uh, gets to Dominica, which is held by the Brits, and manages to get, get over and to join the war against fascism, um, which he saw was cru critically important. Um, but uh, some of the influences when he was in Martinique um, were quite, uh, had a, a very big impact on him. Um, so, um, where are we? Yes, uh, so um, a, fr a French poet called Césaire, who was uh, um, a founder, uh, one of the founders of the Negritude movement, um, which you could describe as an early black power movement, uh, which basically argued that so we couldn't invert the racism that uh, says that we're inferior. Uh, the racism says that we're subhuman. Uh, the racism that says all we're good for is um, having some rhythm and doing a bit of dancing. Um, and anyway, I hope that somehow this could be subverted um, and to say that actually these are good qualities and more than that, um, it shows uh, uh, we're, we're proud of who we are. Um, but anyway, so he was influenced quite heavily by, the, by, uh, by that man's um, ideas. Um, and he was, as I say, he thought that maybe uh, there was a way that, uh, um, that the real French um, revolutionary tradition was still somehow alive. But his, um, his ideas were rudely awoken when he uh, joins the French army, um, and it's a, a, a colonial army. Now, of course, in the history of the Second World War, the French were beaten by the, uh, the Blitzkrieg and so on. And actually, more, more than that, they were beaten by the French ruling class itself. They didn't really want to fight, and actually was quite sympathetic to the Nazis. But anyway, that's another story. But suffice to say, they didn't want to be liberated by others. They wanted to have a part in their own liberation. So de Gaulle launches an invasion of France from, the, from Algeria, one of their imperial holdings uh, into the south of the, of the country. And um, Fanon is in this army and discovers that there's a hi hierarchy in the army, which you shouldn't really have been used to him, but anyway, because um, the, the armies, they, they mirror society, capitalist society. You have the officers at the top, you have uh, troops who die at the bottom. Uh, but layered on top of that, you also have uh, racism. So you have the, the, the Senegalese troops from West Africa and other holdings in West Africa at the bottom of the army. They're the lowest of the low. And just above them are the West Indians, people from the African Caribbean uh, country, uh, countries, islands. Um, and then, of course, you have the white people at the top. Uh, but when the heavy fighting is happening at the beginning of the, of the movement into the interior of France, they, uh, uh, the, the black troops were at the front doing a lot of fighting. But as they get further and further into France, uh, they withdraw the black troops to the back of the army, uh, which he finds rather odd, because um, they don't want the people to see this, these black troops coming to liberate them. Um, they go to dances, uh, the troops who are liberating, these colonial troops who are liberating uh, their oppressors in some ways. Um, and uh, they go some, to some of the dances to celebrate the victories, and they discover that none of the white women want to dance with any of the, the, the black troops who have just come to liberate them, uh, the French black troops, that is. Um, and uh, they would much prefer to dance with the, uh, the, the new prisoners of the Italian fascist army than they would with uh, the people who just liberated them. He finds all of this very, very shocking to his precon preconceptions about uh, the revolutionary traditions of France. Um, anyway, after the war, he finds himself in France and um, studies at Lyon and so on. And he, does, he writes a, a little uh, uh, treatise on... Um, for his uh, doctorate, he's, become, he's, he's, a, he's a doctor, and he goes on to specialise in psychiatry. Um, and it gets rejected because it's too political, and it deals with racism. And it's the book which we have here, uh, Black Skinned uh, White Masks, which deals with lots of the issues that he's struggling with in his head and deals with that contradiction that he's uh, just been forced to face about the realities of French racism. It wasn't just in the colonies, it was also in France proper, if you like. Um, and why I think it's quite a fascinating book um, is because it's, uh, when you compare where we are today, you get a sense of the possibilities um, of really uh, transforming the world and destroying racism. Uh, those ideas that we're, you know, we're told today are uh, grand narratives but no longer apply, but you can't speak about those sort of totalities of being able to uproot things like sexism and racism, but they're too deeply ingrained and so on. He's still held to that idea, no, these things can be overcome, but it has to be done through uh, a revolutionary struggle. And so the, the, the book is fundamentally, I think, a critique of uh, an approach to fighting racism that sees individual solutions as a possibility of uh, achieving achieving liberation. So he, he kind of goes through lots of those, uh, um, those ideas. 
uh, to see if uh, any of them can actually actually work. Um, and um, there's some interesting quotes that he, uh, he, he comes out with when he's talking about it. So um, he talks about um, how there's, there is no Negro mission and there is no white man's burden, in which he's really trying to say that there's no separate struggle. This is, uh, this, this is his humanism coming out, if you like. Um, and, but he looks forward to a society in, of mutual recognition, uh, in other words, where there would be no racism, no inferior and superior. Um, he talks about how I am my own foundation, uh, a, a quote that has been uh, widely misinterpreted perhaps to uh, suggest that he was just talking about individualism, that I'm just who I am and I can say what I like and think what I like, but I don't think that's what he's talking about. He's talking about how uh, um, black people um, are defined by the racist society around them and that he's not going to be defined by uh, what the racists say black people should be or are, um, which uh, again stems from his kind of that uh, grounding in the, the negritude movement, you could argue. Um, and he looks forward to a day when a monument of a white man and a black man, uh, hand in hand, is built somewhere in the world as a recognition of uh, success, successful struggle against racism. Um, and, he, and it's probably worth mentioning, um, but he does talk about man quite a lot, and he is does appear to be quite dismissive of um, women when he's, he says, you know, what, what, so what do I say about uh, the Caribbean woman, uh, woman in this uh, black woman? And he says to himself, uh, well, I can't say anything, I don't know. And then just carries on. And it sounds quite dismissive, um, which people might want to uh, uh, deal with. Um, but I think it's, uh, it's probably worth also saying, that's not to say that there wasn't sexism involved here, but it's also worth saying in terms of where he was coming from, from a philosophical point of view, he was you know, very well read, and in particular was um, uh, familiar with Marxism and with Hegel, and was quite taken by uh, um, Hegel's uh, phenomenology of spirit, or phenomenology of mind, depending on your translation. Um, and... Um, which basically means, uh, phenomenology means lived experience. Uh, and not being a woman, he didn't have a lived experience of being a woman. I don't think this is necessarily correct, by the way. I think you don't have to be the person suffering from oppression in order to actually identify with it or be able to um, analyze it. But nevertheless, that might have been where he was coming from in a certain way that he sounded quite dismissive. But anyway, people might want to come back to that. Um, and uh, whilst we're on Hegel, it comes through in his, uh, in his, in his book. Um, and in particular, he's quite taken with uh, the master-slave dialectic in Hegel. Um, and just briefly, you know, he Hegel's where Marx got the idea of the dialectic from. That's to say that um, you can't look at um, societies as static. Uh, you, can't just, you can't just have sociological categories of people. You've got to think about how actually societies change. And Hegel was very much concerned with ideas and where ideas come from um, and how it is that all of a sudden certain ideas catch hold and revolutions happen. Um, and so he was, no, Hegel was a contemporary of the uh, Haitian revolution I mentioned earlier in San Domingo. Um, and all well, his master-slave dialectic is an abstraction. He wasn't necessarily talking about that, but that's what I think it was worth saying that was in the back of his mind. Um, and what was important to him, um, I think, what is Engels, was his describes it um, as uh, the unity of opposites and the interpenetration of opposites. That's to say you can't have the master without the slave. The, the master can't feel superior unless they have a slave. Um, and but there's a life uh, a death struggle between the master and the slave. And, and it's through each other. It's through the reciprocity. I can never say that word. <laughs> reciprocity. Uh, but through each recognizing the other, um, but they actually find validity. Um, and um, it sees that uh, as a, a, an interesting way of actually understanding how the world can change. So let's, let's look at it from the point of view as, as Marx did it. Uh, he said, well, okay, you've got those ideas, but where are those ideas coming from? They're rooted in a material foundation in class society. So um, another one of Engels, Engels tried to codify it into laws of dialectic, which is, might be problematic. But anyway, one of his laws, I think the third one, was that uh, the negation of the negation that people might be familiar with. Um, that's to say that um, socialism, when we get socialism, negates capitalism, gets rid of capitalism, but nevertheless actually relies on the productive forces of capitalism to create socialism. There's an interpenetration there, if you like. Um, and then there's a negation of socialism by 
communism. So you get the negation of the negation. So communism actually, which is a stateless society where there's no scarcity, so you don't need to have any money and stuff, um, um, gets rid of socialism where you still do have a, sta a state, a workers' state, far more democratic than a capitalist state, obviously. Um, and so he was quite taken of all of those ideas as a way of actually, as a method, a way of looking at the world and a way of actually trying to approach uh, uh, the struggle against racism. But he went a step further and he said, well, that's, that's interesting and I take on board all of that and, that's, and you can see it through his writings, uh, that dialectical way of looking at the world. Um, but he also says, well, the only problem with the, the master-slave dialectic in, in Hegel is, but actually, yes, we could say that, um, that he uh, um, wants uh, recognition from the slave, but that doesn't, that doesn't really work in colonial society. What he wants from the slave is labor. Full stop. And actually more than that, he goes on, I haven't got time to go into it, but he talks about culture being a barrier, because Hegel is talking about an abstraction, and I, an abstracted master-slave, and is assuming that they have a common culture, as to say they can speak to each other in the same language. And Fanon points out, well, actually, that's not true in the colonies. Um, I think you could have explored it a lot further, and I think there's a lot of, hell of a lot of work that could be done in this area of language, in the sense of how language was taken from Africans, um, and that was a key part of uh, the process of oppression and the process of control. Um, but Fanon is obviously aware of that, being from that uh, background. Um, yeah, so um, he, he, he provides uh, a critique. So he's not a Marxist, uh, but nevertheless he understands that that method is a useful way of looking at the world. But basically he doesn't think it goes far enough and doesn't really think that that method and Marxism, which is not so much to do with Hegel, but to do with the practice of the Marxists that existed in his time, um, he doesn't think that has enough uh, to explain racism or to overcome racism and uh, colonialism, um, which we'll come to later. Okay, um, and so ultimately, by the end of Black Skin's White Mask, he's basically rejecting um, negritude, but he's also rejecting the whole idea of individual solutions. So he talks about... Um, uh, mixed marriages, for example. He talks about uh, acquiring a formal education, which is another way of surviving in racist societies. Get yourself well educated, which my parents are quite into. Um, you know, the, the, whole, the whole idea of uh, um, mixed marriages, which is another uh, one that's been, I think, taken out of context because he actually was in a mixed relationship for a very, very long time. Jossi, who was uh, his... Uh, partner in revolution. She was a revolutionary militant in her own right, and she was a, a white woman. So um, some people have taken his critiques of uh, uh, mixed marriages, mixed relationships, as saying he was against them. He wasn't actually made, taking a moral judgment. He wasn't against them as such. He was saying, That's not, that, that might be fine for you, but it's not going to stop racism in wider society. To do that, you have to talk about destroying the structures, and through destroying the structures, dialectical process, people's ideas change, and you can transform uh, people's thinking in terms of racism, getting, ri getting rid of racism. Okay, um, right, let's move on to um, year five of the Algerian Revolution, which has a nice ring to it, I think, but this is its next major work, I would argue. Um, and um, I think that's interesting in the, in the sense that uh, it's called year five, because um, again, we see the, compared to where we are today and some of the leadership of uh, the anti-racist movement. Um, again, he's, uh, he's talking about the possibility of a new world. Uh, and year five, well, year zero, in terms of the Algerian revolution, was um, 1954, when a big insurrection breaks out. Um, and so he's writing this five years, five years later. Um, so he's, gone, he's come back from um, France, and he's gone to Algeria. Um, and in Algeria, he discovers a society where as he puts it, to paraphrase, the white people hate the Jews, the Jews hate the Arabs, and the Arabs hate the blacks. Um, and he's a black man going to Algeria. He speaks French, so he can converse with a fair number of people, because it's, it's the language of the colonialists. But he doesn't speak Arabic. I think we should bear that in mind in all of his writings. But he becomes attached to the Algerian revolution and sees it as a uh, fundamental to where he's going to go in his life, uh, breaking the back of the uh, 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 French colonialist grip on Algeria will be, um, will be a blow against the French colonialists in Martinique also and um, in Vietnam, although Vietnam by this time had already kicked out <laughs> the uh, French. Um, and um, so he becomes very much attached to the, to the cause of the Algerian, of the Algerian revolution. Um, and uh, the 
as I say, year five of the Algerian Revolution is a reference, I think, to the French Revolution. Uh, and people study the French Revolution in 1792. They introduced a new calendar, year zero, because it's going to be a you know, brave new world. So I think it's a reasonable idea. I want to start again and have a new, have a new calendar. And so he was thinking very much in those, in those terms that uh, the anti-colonial struggles could usher in a brave new world. And, this, and, and that, that was his hope. Um, okay, inside, um, and it got a new name. So it's now known as The Studies of a Dying Colonialism, this book, um, which is probably has, um, probably says what it's about more clearly. Okay, I'll phrase three. Um, and in it, he deals with uh, the critique, a crit he develops a critique of Islamophobia, which is actually quite stunning in, um, in how, in, in terms of explaining where we are, where we are today. Um, he talks about how racism continually changes its face, which is a, a massively important sentence to get across to people. There's a static idea of racism, but it's about race. Well, it isn't actually about race, because races don't exist as a scientific category. Uh, what it is, is, is about it was explaining the uh, transatlantic slave trade. Um, and um, to do that, they had to, in the age of liberty, they had to say that black people weren't part of this age of liberty because they were subhuman. Um, but so if you look at the first um, colony of this country, it was, of course, Ireland, where people are white. Um, but it doesn't mean there wasn't racism against Irish people. In fact, it was this massive racism against Irish people, um, which was a key reason why Marx described, it, it describes how the, um, despite the power and the organization of the British working class, um, they're still weakened by the hatred of the Irish, which is kept alive by the, the comic papers and the pulpit. Um, so the Daily Mail and the Sun are still with us, very much the comic papers. Um, and um, so, yeah, so his critique of Islamophobia in, in terms of the French in Algeria, you have a situation where they pretend that they are bringing civilization to Algeria and to these backward Muslims. Um, so they're on a civilizing mission. We know this from the British experience of you know, white man's burden, all that other drivel. Um, they tell us about the British Empire, the French had their own version. And so they have a telling us that you know, they were bringing civilization to, uh, to uh, North Africa and to, to um, these uh, backward countries, um, which is really turning history on its head. Uh, I guess hopefully there are some meetings here on um, um, Islamic, Islamic contribution to civilization, but suffice to say, from a European aspect, um, that of course there would be no uh, Renaissance without Islam, because Islam kept alive ancient learning, and it was transmitted to Europe. That's the only reason you got the Renaissance. And without the Renaissance, there would not have been any Enlightenment. And without the Enlightenment, there would not have been no French Revolution. There would have been no English Revolution, sometimes called the English Civil War, but it was a revolution of the bourgeoisie using the masses below to smash the Aristos. Um, none of that would have happened without Islam that had come before. Anyway, so there's a bit of a cheek on the part of the French in my book. But anyway, so they claim that they're on a civilizing mission. Um, and part of that was... Um, the veil. They had this thing called unveilings, uh, where they would um, get. Uh, a, there's one particular instance where they often get women who didn't wear the veil, <laughs> and there's one instance where they talk. There was a, a woman who didn't wear the veil, and they kidnapped her brother and tortured him, and said, well, "You must go onto this unveiling ceremony uh, and put on a veil and then take it off. Just uh, take it off because you've been persuaded by your civilizing French." Um, betters, but this is the way forward. And so they had these public unveilings to show how uh, progressive uh, uh, the French state was in Algeria. Um, okay. Um, and of course, uh, Fanon is not taken in by any of that and does, uh, understands that actually, and this again has been taken, uh, um, been interpreted wrongly, I would argue. Some people argue that this is uh, uh, a misogynistic reading, because he kind of sort of trumpets up the idea of, uh, of the veil as somehow um, uh, defense of Algerian culture and so forth. But actually, it's also quite pragmatic, you know, because uh, uh, FLN fighters, uh, National Liberation Front, um, fighters in Algeria, um, women, not at the beginning, but became a part of the struggle. Um, and they were a key part of the struggle in terms of smuggling weapons through um, the, uh, um, the French... Um, roadblocks and the barbed wire they encircled the Casbah with in Algiers, and people have seen the film, Battle of Algiers, Al Algiers which um, goes through this uh, uh, beautifully. Um, 
and um, yeah, and uh, so to get through those um, uh, barriers, those uh, roadblocks, and so forth, um, someone would take off deliberately make sure that if they didn't, you know, they would take off their veils and actually put on their lipstick and appear European in order to get through the checkpoint with the bombs and so forth. Um, and uh, there's an important conference, the Sumam conference, um, which was uh, a high point of the Algerian Revolution. A man called um, Ramdani, um, who kind of takes the struggle from the countryside to the cities uh, and to Algiers. Um, and at that conference, um, which was held inside um, Algeria, um, where they talked about a social Algeria, where Islam would have a role, but it would also be a social Al Algeria where actually there'd be equality. Um, um, and uh, again, that was um, uh, it was um, it was overthrown, unfortunately, that whole approach. Um, but nevertheless, um, it took the battle um, to the uh, uh, French state in a way that hadn't been done before, and exposed the, French, the weakness of the French state. Um, and you could. Uh, Compare it perhaps to the Tet Offensive of uh, in in Vietnam. They've already got rid of the, of the French, but now they had the Americans. Um, in '68, the Tet Offensive, which we lost. I say we, the, anti the Liberation Forces, National Liberation Forces, we lost. But nevertheless, it was a defeat politically for the American Army because it showed that they could be attacked simultaneously all over the country and that um, they had no control. And a similar situation was developing in Algeria. Um, and uh, Ramdani takes the battle too to the French uh, with bombings in the, in the cafes. Algiers is split up into uh, a French district, a European district, uh, which is all the best parts, and uh, the people that, whose country actually was had to live in all the worst parts. Um, and so getting between those different districts is quite difficult. They put all these blocks and stuff. Um, okay. Um, I've only got 10 minutes left, so I've, I've just got time to get to the masterwork, as it were, uh, The Wretched of the Earth, which I'm hopefully people have, uh, have, have read. Um, and uh, that's a very interesting and useful book, and you can get a feel for it just by looking at the chapter headings, um, which I quickly wrote down. So the first one, Concerning Violence. The second on uh, spontaneity, its strengths and weaknesses. Well, he's not talking about the spontaneous struggle in terms of, you know, anarcho approach to... Um, fighting back. He's talking about uh, spontaneity. He means struggles outside of the control of the Nationalist Party, as he, as he talks about it in uh, The Wretched of the Earth. Um, uh, the pitfalls of national consciousness um, and, uh, and, on, and another chapter on, uh, on um, uh, the colonial war and mental disorder, which is basically his case notes as a psychiatrist. Um, and I think the most important thing to take from the Wretched of the Earth is that it's a critique of the national liberation movements. But more than that, it's also, it's, it's also um, a work which identifies with, uh, with the struggle of, uh, of the oppressed and argues actually that the violence of the oppressed is uh, necessary uh, to overcome the bigger violence of the oppressor. Uh, so the first chapter concerning violence um, has been much uh, talked about and has been read by some as really just... Um, an excuse for uh, uh, terrorism, an excuse for uh, uh, bombings of uh, civilians and, and so forth. Um, but he kind of pounds away in the book, and it's kind of, you know, he's, he's a brilliant writer, and people read it, you can just see he keeps going on and on about it, yes, but, you know, um, you have uh, the aircraft that can machine gun us from the skies, you have your fleet that, that um, uh, bombards us from the Mediterranean, and then you whinge about some bombs in cafes blowing up your Air Force commanders. Um, and, you know, you've got to agree with him. Um, but he goes beyond that and argues that actually uh, violence is a cleansing, um, a cleansing force, uh, and that's for a national liberation struggle to really succeed. Um, it has to be a violent struggle, which isn't actually what happened in Africa or necessarily elsewhere. There were some states where that happened, there was quite a lot of places where that didn't happen, there wasn't a, a huge violent struggle. And I think it's just worth saying that the Algerian struggle was incredibly violent. Uh, back in 1945, for example, um, you have a, a situation of a, 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 um, a massacre of, um, of um, Algerians, um, which numbers, well, could have been as many as 45,000, some say it's 15,000, the French claimed it was 1,000, but certainly at least 15,000 people were killed. Um, and in that massacre, uh, the French Communist Party, which is the reason why um, 
Fanon wasn't too keen on the Stalinized version of Marxism, which was espoused by the French Communist Party. The French Communist Party was briefly in government after the war because of their prestige in leading the uh, uh, resistance movement. Uh, similar in Italy, their prestige was very high in the class and elsewhere in society, and so they were temporarily in the government, and they went along with the mass repression in Algeria uh, against the lib national liberation uh, uh, movement. Um, so you can see why it didn't really go down too well with, uh, with Fanon. Um, uh, so, you know, and, and in the, his uh, um, critique of national liberation struggles, he's arguing basically that these people are, um, as he puts it, uh, the people who are leading the struggles, this is despite the fact that he's a leading member of the FLN, um, but he is uh, one of the editors of their paper in Tunisia, he's in exile now, he's in Tunisia and writes for the paper and so forth. Um, it talks about them as uh, flesh-eating animals, jackals and vultures which wallow in the people's blood. Um, he talks about a rising uh, middle class or bourgeoisie. He's quite, I think, confused about it because he kind of conflates the two things and he sees the, uh, the workers as part of that in terms of being the urban dwellers in our, our slightly privileged position. Um, and um, he see, sees them as being incapable of really leading um, the struggle to success because of the lack of ideology, uh, but which he meant the uh, lack of going beyond what happens after we've got rid of the French or after we've kicked out the Brits or whatever it is, uh, what kind of society are we going to create? And there's no real discussion about any of that. It's uh, about tactics, it's about strategy and so forth, about when to open negotiations with the French, because basically militarily we can't beat them, um, but neither can actually the French win. But there's no idea about what kind of Algeria is going to come after the revolution. Um, again, it's quite influenced by Sartre, um, among others. And Sartre does a, an intro to the, um, to the book. Um, and Sartre wrote a, another book called, um, let me get my names right, of this, yes, his Critique of Dialectical Reason, in which he basically is talking about uh, how a party, a revolutionary party, can keep its fervor and can keep going forward after the revolution. You know, you've done the big bit, you've got the revolution, going to go to sleep now. Um, but no, he's talking about that problem. Um, and, Fanon has that in the back of his mind, I think, when he's writing this book, because he's talking about the problem, okay, make the, the, the revolution in, uh, against the colonialists, but what happens after, what happens after that revolution? Um, and he basically is extremely prescient in predicting that um, without a thoroughgoing revolutionary struggle, which involves violence, because he thinks that's a way in which it cleanses, but also in which it actually... Uh, um, make sure that the revolution won't be sold out. Um, but he's in a situation where, well, if you look um, at those liberation struggles, that doesn't actually happen in very large numbers of places, like Ghana, for example. There was no big um, violent struggle against the British. The British basically come to a deal. Um, or in India, there was, uh, wasn't, a, wasn't a massive um, violent national liberation struggle as such, although the British did create violence by divide and rule, um, which meant that a million died in India. So you could say it was violent in that sense, but it wasn't actually a violent struggle in itself to get rid of the, get rid of the British. Um, so what uh, Fanon was looking at was settler states, uh, which Algeria was a hell of a settler state. Um, there was a million uh, French white people in Algeria who, um, who were hanging on to power. And uh, they had organizations, you know, paramilitary organizations that tortured and killed on a mass scale, as did the French army itself. Um, if you know, want to know where the Front National comes from, it's the backbone of that organization is from these people. Uh, it all left as soon as, soon as uh, 62 happens and uh, um, uh, Algeria gets, uh, gets independence. Um, but in many other places, there weren't violent struggles. So that wasn't quite correct. He also argued that um, you couldn't really rely on the working class because they were bought off, not just in Europe, but in the uh, colonies also. Um, and that the place, the place where the revolution could be most secured is in the countryside and among the peasantry and among what he called the lumpen proletariat, um, which again um, is quite pressing in talking about the mega slums, for example, that began to develop around uh, urban centers in Africa, which is certainly where we are today. Um, but the idea that the peasantry could lead the struggle uh, defies reason because nowhere in history has the peasantry led the struggle. Um, so, for example, China, which he was quite fond of in 1949, that was a peasant army, but it was led by the intelligentsia. 
uh, or even in the case of Cuba, there was no peasant army. It was just the intelligentsia, a band of a few hundred people uh, that had an idea, but the state was so rotten they could push it out of the way quite quickly. Um, so you saw, you saw that as a, a model also in terms of using the armed struggle. Um, but at the end of the day, um, he's basically develops a theory, which I think is quite similar to where, to where um, Tony Cliff, the founder of the First Social Workers' Party, uh, came from on, on this subject, what he called deflected permanent revolution, which is this idea that, uh, for example, in Russia, you had a very backward country with lots of peasants uh, and a very small working class, and, and you had a bourgeoisie that was in bed with the Tsarists, who were basically a feudal society. Uh, and Trotsky said, well, nevertheless, the workers still made a revolution. How did that happen? Uh, well, the bourgeoisie were never going to do it because they're too linked to the old order, um, but the workers uh, could do it because they, uh, they had a situation of combined and even development, uh, and so they had massive economic power, which um, was exaggerated inside, of, inside of Russian society. So they, they were in a position to lead other classes, namely the peasantry, in a successful move to actually sort out the uh, getting to capitalism bit, that stage, if you like, but actually didn't have to stop there. They could go further and actually get to socialism. Didn't have to wait for 200 years of industrialization or what have you. They could get to socialism by actually breaking through. Um, so why didn't that happen in the third world? Because in the third world, there's no workers' movements that were leading the struggle. Uh, and um, to explain that, Fanon starts to explain it, but he's doing it through the, uh, the prism of the uh, of Stalinized um, uh, communist parties and their perversion of Marxism, if you like. Um, so these Stalinist type parties were, um, were a block on the development of the workers' movement. And so he sees, for example, in Algeria, he sees that there was, there's a significant working class in Algeria. They go on strikes. They have, uh, and there's a significant working class, obviously, in Europe, which he sees as being brought off. But in Algeria, there was one. Uh, and there was an Algerian Communist Party, which was linked to the French. There was, this, there was uh, the, the Unions in Algeria were linked to certain CGT, for example, in France and so on. There were big, big unions. Um, but he sees these as being part of the uh, uh, link to the, uh, uh, the colonial setup and that they were getting bought off by the, by the colonial powers. Um, and so the, the role of the French Communist Party in destroying that uh, possibility um, meant that. Uh, the workers' movement wasn't in the lead. They didn't take the lead. And so he never saw that. He didn't see that happen. So it's understandable why Fanon dismissed it, uh, dismissed the possibility of workers being able to actually uh, uh, take the lead. Uh, so he looks to the peasantry. But uh, to, to sum up, basically the peasantry are led by other classes. Um, so they're like a, uh, once you take the manor house and you've got your bit of land, you just go back and farm your bit of land. There's no collective there. Um, um, and that uh, was the case very much in Algeria also. Um, sure, people supported the, the revolution, um, uh, but not everyone did. And some people were, were brought um, into collaborating with, uh, with uh, the colonialists. Um, OK. Um, so Fanon uh, uh, predicts a situation where these, uh, once we've got uh, uh, the national liberation struggle, we've kicked out the Algerians and the Europeans, what happens next? And he predicts the situation, unless we have these uh, uh, mass uprisings of, uh, from below, which can cleanse uh, the party, uh, that problem that Sartre was dealing with, the way to, to get that further back and to actually continue the revolution, that has to come from below, come from the people. And the people he looks to is not so much the workers in the urban centers, but to the, to the, to the peasantry. Um, and he charts out a path to uh, a socialist kind of humanism, um, but he doesn't see that as limited to nation states. And he's, uh, he's really very, very critical of the whole idea of African unity and the whole idea of a common African culture. And he says, you know, what, the only thing that we have in common is our common struggle against colonialism. Um, and that uh, these, uh, these jackals and these profiteers who uh, pretend to be the national leaders of the movement, um, unless we bring them to heel by the popular struggle from below, they will take the place of the European um, ruling class in, in the colonies, and they will um, usurp the gains of the revolution for themselves. And that, and sadly, is what has come, come to pass in all over, the, uh, all over Africa, all over any other country that's been liberated from the uh, European colonialists. Um, OK, I've run out of time. Um, and that was very much the case of Algeria. Um, you know, ben Bella, people might have heard of, was the first president of Algeria for a few years. Um, and he talks about a social Algeria. He talks about the possibility of, of marrying Islam and socialism. 
um, which people might find a bit odd, but you know, Tony Benn talked about marrying Christianity and socialism, and no one found that particularly odd. But anyway, but uh, quite possible, I suppose. Um, but not, but uh, it wasn't a revolutionary Marxist approach. But nevertheless, he talked about the possibilities of you know nationalisation and uh, workers' control from below, workers' and peasants' committees that sprang up in Algeria for a few years after the revolution, and um, the new state allowed that to go forward. Um, but then there was a coup by Boumediene in 65, and with the Algerian dictatorship that we know today, um, that's where they came from. Um, and that was repeated across, um, across Africa. Um, okay, uh, the legacy of Fanon, you can see it's, uh, it's, I haven't mentioned this in any of his psychiatry, I think we just, I should do that before I finish. In one of his legacies is uh, in, in psychiatry, and I started off by talking about totalities. Um, he applied that to his psychiatry and to an understanding of why people have various problems that they did have in, um, in their heads because of colonialism. Uh, he, when he arrived in uh, uh, Blida, just outside uh, Algiers, and he was practicing there, it's now called, I think, Fanon University, uh, sorry, Fanon Hospital. Um, he was practicing there, and um, he came across this thing called North Africa Syndrome. They're all the, the French doctors and the thing called North Africa Syndrome. We've got all these men that come in with those stomach problems. Why have they got stomach problems? And it's, you know, they have stomach problems because they're living in a society that humiliates them on a daily basis, but says that they're inferior, uh, but says that uh, they are virtually subhuman in the face of the French people who were dominating them. That's why there was those, that's why there was those problems. Um, so he looks to uh, uh, a society where we can overcome uh, the, uh, um, uh, the problems of racism, but also you know, the problems of in people's heads by actually uh, through this process of revolutionary struggle from below. Uh, um, and so he's, he rejects the idea of the free market, but he also rejects the idea of the statist nationalization and prefers, much prefers uh, the peasants to be directly in control and the workers to some, some extent to be directly in control in uh, self-organizing dem democratic organizations from below. Um, but that really doesn't actually come to pass. What can we take from Fanon? Um, first and foremost, he was a, a revolutionary. Um, he looked to a socialist humanism. He, wasn't, he was uh, a man of his time, so the, the, uh, the Marxism that he knew about was very much one which had written off the, the, the working class or the proletariat in terms of classical Marxism and looked to shortcuts through other vehicles like the guerrilla struggle, like the peasantry. Um, so it's understandable that he would go down those roads, but what he did understand was that for the movement to go forward, it had to depend on the people below, the masses, or the masses to actually push the struggle forward. And so today, um, and he also, also understood actually the combined and uneven development that Trotsky talked about, about how actually you could leapfrog. He talks about how the radio was used in the revolution in Algeria, uh, how the radio set was uh, liberated from the, from the French and how people went and bought radios and they sold out of radios all over Algeria because people used them to listen to the broadcast of the FLN from outside the country and so on. Uh, he talked about how, you know, how they could possibly leapfrog, uh, leapfrog uh, the Europeans. He talked about how uh, there was another way forward which didn't rely on nation states. Stop, you know, don't talk about tribalism, don't talk about chieftains often kept alive by the Europeans in the African countries and all these artificial states. He said, we've got to clear them out. We need to talk about uh, uh, um, like getting rid of the nation states given to us by the, by the Europeans. And all of, in all of that, I think there's much to take from Fanon. Uh, but we need to go further. And so I'd appeal to people here who aren't in the Socialist Workers' Party to join us because he was a revolutionary, but we need to make sure that that revol revolution happens where we have the power. Um, and in Africa today, within 10 years, the majority of people in Africa will actually live in cities, um, which, which was, was not the case in Fanon's time. Um, and you can see um, how the, the possibilities of places like Nigeria, in, in Nairobi, in Kenya, and in South Africa, for workers to take the lead is very much not pie in the sky, but very much a, a necessity that has to happen. And um, the fact that workers were, to some extent, taking the lead in terms of destroying apartheid in South Africa shows the possibilities, but the South African Communist Party was Stalinized. Um, so they said, don't take the lead, let's join up with the progressive middle classes, the progressive bourgeoisie, and they will take the lead instead. So we need to build new parties which do see the workers as the way forward in all of the so-called third world, what we now call the global south. And actually, Fallon is a very useful tool in understanding that. Um, so yeah, read the stuff and join the Socialist Workers' Party. I just wanted to ask a question really about why, why doesn't the, the ruling classes learn anything from uh, these struggles 
For example, as Gary said correctly, there was an armed struggle in Algeria that played a, a role in the liberation of that country, but also there was protests, in, actually the protests in France in 1960-1961 against the violent brutality and killings of these death squads that Gary spoke about, which culminated in that there was a, a, a big protest in 1961 where hundreds of protesters were gunned down in the street, which was actually the step that brought the uh, camels back for the French in Algeria. And then you've got Francois Hollande who came in November 2015 and said, this is the worst atrocity in France since the Second World War. Uh, why do they lie? Why doesn't the British ruling class learn from this struggle in Ireland? Uh, why, why doesn't the ruling classes in the biggest powers like in the US don't understand that this Islamophobia is the biggest recruitment session for uh, jihadist groups such as ISIS? And why do you think ISIS has been defeated when they're well, it's only when they're making the problem even worse. Okay, so um, if anybody speaks for too long, I'm going to tap on the mic like this. Right. Thank you. Um, I think I would like to make some contributions to the presentation because of the perceived gap I have um, seen. Uh, most of the time, we try to pour encomiums on these historical figures, you know, um, Mark on X, France, Fanon, and the rest of them. But we haven't really taken time to look at the other side of the cinema. Uh, France Fanon was from Martinique, all right, the um, French possession in the Caribbean. And he has, you know, given us a foundation, the reason to fight against the evil of colonialism, as well as racism. In his book, you know, Black Skin, White Mask, and that has to emphasize the existential, I mean, the psycho existential, you know, division, the Manichaean division of, you know, us versus them, the self versus other. But on the other hand, if you see the inherent contradictions in the person of, you know, Franz Fanon, is that she, she, he married, he married, you know, a white lady from Florida, all right? Pretty much like the other people um, who championed the cause of, you know, negritude. Um, I remember uh, the Senegalese uh, uh, president, uh, late uh, Le Poseda Senghor, who was also, you know, a, a fan of uh, a MSCZ and the young Ramal Trakul from the Caribbean. All these people, they try to see, uh, to, I mean, to, to make us see that, you know, there's evil in the other way because they have been suppressed. But on the other hand, they jettison that philosophy by, you know, you know, going into what I would like to call a kind of, um, uh, universal humanism, yeah, I think uh, that we, we, we have that in the introduction where he talks about the striving for new humanism. So we need to see beyond, okay, that narrow confines of, you know, racial debate, which doesn't hold water today, especially in the era where we campaign, I'm not for the all black, I mean black lives matter, I am for all lives matter, in the sense that we have to press for the universal humanism. And of course, we have to begin from the particular to the universal. That way, you respect my race, I respect your race. You respect my humanity, I respect your humanity. That's the point, all right? So we need to look at the contradictions within these people because he never married a black or a Martinican you know, lady, all right? He married from a state where it was even outlawed. Looking at white women at the time in Florida, you will get killed. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Martin from North London. Just coming uh, back on the point the previous comrade made, I think this is the 50th anniversary of uh, Loving versus the state of Virginia, which was uh, the case of um, a black woman and a white man trying to get married in, 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 in Virginia at the time and that being against the law as you as you said and probably similar things in Florida where uh, Franz Fanon's wife uh, came from. Um, what I also wanted to say is um, uh, could you expand on uh, certain aspects of um, you know 
influences that um, uh, Fanon may have had on other uh, <coughs> um, uh, uh, power issues, uh, people, you know, the likes of Malcolm X or James Baldwin or, or uh, other people that were associated with either with the uh, Panther movement or Negritude movement or so on. So forth. Gary, I really enjoyed that talk. Um, I mean, one of the things that I think is so fundamental about Fanon, um, which is, you know, Gary's emphasised it as a theme running right the way through his talk, is how he was a completely uncompromising fighter on the side of the oppressed. I mean, you know, that's the shining glory. The question that was asked by the first contributor, which was, you know, why do the British state or the French state not learn anything from what, what uh, you know, any of this history? And I'm assuming you mean, why is it that they haven't drawn the lessons that Fanon draw, drew, which is that, you know, the oppressed uh, don't like being oppressed and they're going to fight back. Well, the reason that they don't understand this is because it's not in their interest. You know, I mean, sort of, you know, the, the, the state, when it comes to capitalism and imperialism, what they draw from the experiences of the Algerian fight for independence, or anywhere else for that matter, they do draw, draw, draw lessons. The lessons they draw is that to understand that they have to be better equipped to keep our side exploited and to keep our side oppressed. That's the lesson that they draw constantly from this. So, for example, it isn't any accident that when it came to the Gulf Wars in the 90s and in the 2000s, the United States state had learnt from their errors in the Vietnam War, particularly in terms of allowing um, journalists to go in willy-nilly wherever they wanted to and report stories back home of atrocities that were committed by American troops. These are the lessons that they draw. You know, the point from our side is also to draw lessons, and to draw lessons with complete and utter clarity, not just about the nature of what the struggle is, but also about what the nature of the, our oppressors are and our exploiters are. I mean, some, you know, somebody else in the uh, discussion talked about um, humanity, um, and you used the phrase, um, you know, uh, you respect my humanity, I will respect yours. Now, in one sense, no human being could, could quibble with that because it sounds eminently reasonable. Um, and of course it does, you know, because we all want to be uh, completely human towards each other because that's what we are. But there's also a, a little danger to that phrase because, you know, if you say to the oppressor, to our rulers, that, you know, if you respect me, I'll respect you back. Well, what is it that we're respecting on their part? Are we respecting their right to be powerful over us? Are we respecting their right to oppress us and to exploit us, to denigrate our humanity? Because that's what freedom for them means. And in the same way that Fanon understood that on the question of violence, there is no parallel between the violence that is used by the oppressed to fight back against their oppressor. He understood that very, very clearly in our, you know, we have to also extend that to understand that when we talk about our humanity, and you know, and I want to see humanity and genuine human, liber human liberation for absolutely everybody, but there's only one fundamental way that that's going to come across, and it can only come across by prosecuting a war to the finish against those who oppress us. And you have to do that with total clear politics about both the nature of the struggle, the nature of the state, and that you can't compromise with these people. I mean, in a way, that's what was part of also Fanon's strength, is that he didn't want to make compromises, um, either with the capitalist imperialist state, but he also understood what the pitfalls and the political weaknesses were of national liberation movements when they came to power, and how they didn't deliver. Uh, anything for us. So you know, I think that's quite important. Um, I just have a final question, which is, um, I suppose it's also an issue. You talked about psychiatry, um, and um, and particularly, I mean, you know, for, for those people who, um, you know, if you're, if you're young students, um, and if you study social science courses, um, there's a geezer that always comes up when they talk about knowledge and about um, how psychologically 
uh, people have been damaged by the experience of racism and imperialism. And that person is Foucault, Michel Foucault, who is you know, really the sexy guy that's talked about within academia to students and academics. And of course, he talks about knowledge. He talks about how knowledge is power. And that, again, that sounds really radical because it's, uh, you know, people extend it and start saying phrases like, um, oh, because uh, white people are dominant, they're the ones that have all the knowledge, so they're the ones that have all the power. Um, and it's really interesting because when you study and you learn about the way that Fanon talked about these sorts of issues, um, it's not based upon that kind of analysis. You know, Fanon's analysis, there, there are problems with it, and I don't want to hide any of those problems, but at least it was, it was, it was an attempt to root it in a material analysis about society in terms of where power really does come from, um, in terms of the monopoly of state violence, the monopoly of power. Um, and so I think that's quite important. My final my question to you, Gary, or to anybody else in the audience, is you mentioned Sartre, um, and obviously there was a very close relationship between Sartre and his ideas and uh, Fanon. But also, um, and you mentioned the French Communist Party, and obviously it's Stalinoid, um, state and what have you, and how Fanon quite rightly was not impressed by this, and in a sense it's, you know, he was a victim of the fact that there wasn't any other opening on the French left that he could have gravi gra gravitated towards um, in terms of uh, trying to recuperate an analysis of socialism from below, you know, which is where he was wanting to grapple with. But what reception was there on other sections of the French left that were not necessarily under the influence of the French communist line about Fanon's ideas. Um, so, I don't know if you or anybody else in the audience uh, has an answer to that. Anything? Anybody has any questions? Or anything you didn't quite understand? Thanks uh, for a wonderful introduction and uh, discussion. Um, <clears throat> what I take from Fanon, and I'm by no means an expert on him, but the and from what I take from the from this meeting is is his desire to take the fight to the finish. And whatever mistakes and whatever even strategic wrong turnings are taken, uh, without that willingness to take the fight to the finish, there's no prospect of. Uh, liberation for humankind, in my view. Uh, and uh, Sartre was mentioned, again, I'm not qualified to, uh, to, to speak authoritatively on, uh, on Sartre, but um, I do know the French Communist Party did not support the liberation of Algeria. They, were, they lined up with the French imperialism on the question. Sartre, in a period when there was a vicious uh, witch hunt against people who did, support uh, uh, freedom for Algeria, uh, signed a famous, organized a famous letter supporting, supporting the thing and so on. So my last point then is just, I think, just as my first point, that the fight to the end is tremendously important, but then we look at the world today and we see how many of these things have run into the buffers, have left us with a world that's not substantially better. Okay. Does that mean that the fight wasn't worth it? No, it doesn't. But it means that those who follow must learn. If you want to know where all the terrorism comes from, it's the collapse and the, and the shipwreck of Stalinism, Baathism, bourgeois nationalism, and the rest of it. And therefore, authentic revolutionary Marxism can be the only, only way forward. And that's why I'm a member of the Socialist Workers' Party. I'll take the man over there, yeah. I'm just talking because Fanat talked about the, what was the alternative to the French Communist Party politics in France and the audience of uh, I the, for, the first thing is, uh, we have to say, I don't know, comrades uh, talked about the uh, 62 demonstration in France. Uh, where uh, mainly I think it was six 
because his party uh, members were killed by the police. Uh, it was a demonstration against the far right support for uh, French Algeria. But the French Communist Party was not part of another demonstration where hundreds of Algerians were killed in the street of Paris in October 61. And to be honest, and you know, that's part of the, the history, even very important in understand for what happened in France and racism and Islamophobia in France right now. The, the French left, uh, you know, was uh, on the minority of the, of the, of the French currents were part of the support for the uh, Algerian uh, uh, fight for independence. Uh, it's very interesting, but it's very interesting. It's a, it's a big lesson, I think, for, for us now, because it was very a minority uh, of the French currents, partly the Christians left, uh, and the revolutionary left, you know, Trotskyist, Libertarian, what was becoming the Maoist, or would become, and coming from the Christian left partly, uh, the Maoist left. But what is very interesting as said, uh, I can't go into a, a lot of details, but this support and this political activity from a minority part of the French left, young people, uh, in, uh, uh, in support for the uh, for the Algerians, were the core of the left that won uh, larger support in '68. I mean, the position of these currents were very important to rebuild a tradition that was larger in uh, in '68. And I think that's a lesson for us now. I just want what about what I know about the debates in the French left. The debates was maybe I'm wrong less about Fanon than the famous introduction by Sartre uh, of the, I don't know in, in English, Les Damnés de la Terre. Yeah. And a, a big argument be between Sartre and Camus about the question of violence, uh, because the position of Sartre was really <laughs> strong. Uh, there, I think there's a sentence in this introduction where he say that uh, the violence, when, when an, uh, and he was talking about the Algerians, when an oppressed kill uh, an oppressor, uh, there, is, there are two levels of uh, liberation. One, a level of, uh, only you, against oppression, you kill an oppression, but as well something for uh, killing your, you know, the integration of oppression in your uh, own body, mind, and so on. So it was a very radical thinking, but it's very important, and about even some intervention you, you made. You know, I think universal equality is very good, and it's, uh, it's sort of what, what we are fighting for. But we have to start by recognizing, and that's where Fanon is coming back in the debate inside French society now, especially through the indigenous currents and so on, uh, about the idea that to go to university you have to recognize the discriminations now and they are not just you know some abstract and ideological discrimination from a white people, a white working class, you can think that racism is just diverting and dividing people. When you're black or Arab in France or Muslims, you experience is direct and uh, real discrimination and uh, attacks and so on. So you have to recognize the right and the necessity for the oppressed to be in a relationship where they are organized for their rights and that the way you can bring the question of class, the question of unity and so on. Yeah, um, Let's start with the French, uh, the French left, who um, sometimes get a, a bad press from the British left um, regarding the fight against fascism in France and uh, the weaknesses and so forth. Um, and certainly in terms of the Algerian context, um, there's many good reasons to criticise the French uh, Communist Party, as we uh, the comrades have, uh, uh, have said. But there are others beyond the French Communist Party. Actually, even the, the French Communist Party's newspaper was better than the party itself. They did highlight the relentless torture, the torture camps in the Sahara, the sheer 
brutality of the Pidmoir regime in Algeria, in Algeria and so forth. Um, but there are other forces beyond the French Communist Party, although they were the dominant force, that's uh, that is the truth of the matter. Um, but there were, there were Trotskyist organisations and so on. And um, uh, Fanon himself uh, had many, many discussions with all of these people on the left. Um, and he's very much concerned with uh, uh, where the European working class was going. Although Sartre argues in his introduction that Fanon isn't really addressing the European working class, this is for the colonies, but actually he was, really. And um, because he still actually believed in that Enlightenment idea, and that idea that actually humanity could be liberated, and he still hoped that there would be a role for the uh, French working class. Um, although I couldn't see it quite happening. Um, and uh, Sartre, it's uh, worth saying, was, um, uh, he was a, a person who brought together the manifesto of 121, which uh, were people who came out and said, no, French people should not join the army and go to Algeria, which was basically a seditious thing to do. And people went to prison for it. Um, so, you know, to his credit, uh, Sartre understood that. He went off the rails, I, I think, in terms of imperialism, when uh, Israel did the uh, 67 war against uh, the Arab countries in which Sartre sadly supported. But at this point, he was uh, very, very clear on whose side he was on. Um, and therefore, although he's, like some people have argued that he kind of goes overboard on the violence thing in the introduction, um, nevertheless, he was absolutely right, as Denis and others have pointed out, to understand that actually the violence of the oppressed is nothing compared to the violence of the oppressor, and that sometimes violence is necessary. And I think a better way of looking at Sartre is not so much that he was pro-violence, is that he was against <laughs> non-violence. Uh, the idea that uh, <coughs> you get quite often under uh, the uh, Grenfell Memorial in, in Parliament Square, we had some Gandhi lover who got up and said, yeah, we're all going to be non-violent, blah, 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 which kind of incensed me, so I just did a little bit about Fanon after she was finished talking, which kind of cut the mood much better, I think, because people understand that actually self-defence is no offence. Uh, the, the French working class, actually the best militants, did understand that actually supporting French, uh, the, Alger the struggle against the French in Algeria was part and parcel of a wider class struggle to weaken the French ruling class at home. Um, he spent time, Fanon spent time with uh, French trade union militants in, the, in their houses and so on. And he says at uh, one point in one of his books that um, these are real anti-racist people. Um, and it wasn't just talk, actually, in very, very many uh, instances of French militants when uh, people would, um, the security guards would come into a factory and say, oh, you, the Algerian worker, and you, the, uh, uh, the white indigenous worker, come out to the front, someone from the family wants to see you, which is a ruse to get you uh, uh, nicked. Uh, to get arrested, um, which they often tried to do. Um, people understood what was going on and they organised to, to uh, kick the security guards out and to have a strike to prevent any of the workers getting arrested to defend their Algerian brothers and sisters. Um, and um, the FLN also had an orientation on France, um, so they divided up the country into regions or Walliers, and there were seven of them, and the seventh one was France. And in France, they had a tax regime where they got money, raised money, and so on. And um, again, the French left was involved in that, the better parts of the French left. And to their credit, after liber liberation, uh, yes, you have, uh, as I say, the, 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 the Pidmoir, which means black feet, my French is rubbish. But anyway, then you had the, the Pied. Rouge, who went to France, who went to Algeria after independence. Um, I think it's Fanon or no, actually, I think it's um, Leo Zelig in his book points out that the, there was something like only 38 engineers in liberated Algeria, a population of 9 million people. You can see this is a pop that reflected right across the colonial world in the new societies and all the French people with all of their education, sadly, because they had all the education, they all left all at once. Wow, what's left? So they had volunteers that came from France, like 20,000 people from the French left and beyond who came to offer their services as engineers, as teachers and so on. Um, in this period, that brief period when Ben Bella was trying to actually take France in a more socialist, uh, take France, take Algeria in a more socialist uh, direction. So we should mention them and, and it's to their credit. But generally, but generally speaking, sadly, the French Communist Party has a, a, a lot to answer for, sadly. Um, Okay, um, doo, 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 doo. and um, the, math, the question of uh, having the correct politics is, is uh, it sounds um, kind of uh, uh, dismissive, but uh, what do you mean by correct politics? So actually learning the lessons of history is what we, is what, is what we mean. Um, and that mattered, and so it mattered for people like uh, Fallon, he, he, was, he was against bullshit. Um, and so, you know, when he went to uh, Accra, as, uh, and he was the ambassador for the, uh, 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 for the um, Algerian provisional um, uh, government, 
and so there's, there's a liberated Ghana, which had loads and loads of conferences where people would get up and spout about African unity, pan-Africanism and so on, but it was just all hollow and hot, hot air. And what you wanted to see was uh, an African legion, uh, well, which is to say um, an armed uh, organisation uh, uh, supported by the newly liberated African states that would open up a second front, a southern front in Algeria. Um, and um, okay, and uh, he was talking to people at one conference, and he was talking about Angola, and he was so he was so keen that there had to be another front, more fronts opened. He says to the Angolans, he's trying to speak to the people who were became the MPLA, which did lead the liberation struggle in um, Mozambique, in Angola, um, and. Um, and they weren't up for doing the insurrection because they weren't ready for it. They didn't have enough people inside the country, they didn't have enough arms and so on. But he found enough, another group who were up for it. And he persuaded them it was a good idea to launch an insurrection. So they go and launch an insurrection in Angola and 20,000 people died. And that's on Fallon's head. Um, we've talked about a lot, but you know, it's, so it matters what your political strategy was. Um, you know, and, and it emphasised the fact that Fallon wasn't just talking about things in the abstract. He was talking about it as a real revolutionary engaged at the, fourth, at the front of the struggle. Um, so politics does um, does matter big time. Um, yeah, the uh, point about this universal humanism, we shouldn't get too carried away with it because we have to also look at the dangers. So people talk about famine today, the alt right, let's just say the fascists in America, to give them the proper name. They talk about famine. They talk about famine as the possible apostle of violence. And but the Black Lives Matter movement is an out growth of Fanon, because uh, he preached violence and the Black Lives Matter movement preaches violence against the police and so on. And um, these are all lies, but we need to be uh, clear with their lies and therefore the uh, All Lives Matter slogan is not useful in that context because it misses out a bit, but actually you have to address the fact that there is real oppression, there is real racism in, in, in uh, American society, there is a, 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 a new Jim Crow where, uh, was it a third of uh, black males? Uh, by 2020 will have been inside the uh, uh, prison system or the, uh, the system of incarceration and, and injustice in America. Uh, you can't get around that, so you have to recognise that. Uh, then we can, once we recognise that and we're fighting that, then we can talk about all lives matter, as I say, socialism. Um, but uh, no, socialists have to be the tribunes of the oppressed, is how the Russian revolution, revolutionary Lenin put it. So I also respect people that will stand up and fight, black people, this is what I'm talking about, who will stand up and fight for black liberation, but I respect them more if they'll stand up and fight for women's liberation and for gay liberation also, which is what the Panthers did, who were inheritors, I think, of what, where Fallon, Fallon was coming from. Uh, they, they understood the, um, uh, how important it was uh, for, for the, of the right of the oppressed to fight back by any means necessary. Um, which is a phrase Fatman sort of uses, says, but then he talks about violence. Uh, violence, in fact, is necessary. He wasn't in favour of any old violence, just for the sake of it. Um, he was in favour of the violence that is necessary to win. Um, and um, also, we should say, just in defence of Fatman, uh, when he talked about violence, he knew about violence intimately um, because he was a psychiatrist who treated the torturers as well as teaching the tortured. So he knew all about it. Um, he knew the problems of those people on our side, the liberation forces that had planted bombs and then we felt sorry about it because they thought, because they then discovered that there were white people that were racist. They didn't know, they weren't anti-Arab, which I didn't realise before until they discovered all of these um, people from France coming over to help in the newly liberated Algeria. And so they had problems in their head about that. Uh, but, you know, it goes through lots of examples of uh, two Algerian boys that kill someone that they used, uh, 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 a white boy that they used to play with. And they said, why did they kill that boy? Because he used to play with him. Well, he's the only one we could, could because he used to play with him, but we killed him because he was the only one who would come and play with us so we could take him up the hill and kill him. But yeah, but why did he kill him? Well, it's because they say, because his dad is in the militias and they say kill all the Arabs. So, okay, okay, that's fine. So, we so tried to explain it. Um, and and uh, through the, not through what's going on in an individual's head, but through what's going on in, in the society. Uh, another example he gives of, um, if I've got to wind up, of um, in his case book, uh, case notes in uh, Vegetable of the Earth, which are, look, people should go and, uh, uh, go and read. Um, was it Vegetable of the Earth? It might have been earlier. But uh, when he talks about um, how uh, a torturer goes to the hospital to go and see Fallon because he can't sleep at night and he beats up his wife because he's involved in his torturing all the time. He can't sleep because he uh, keeps hearing the screaming of the person he's been torturing, or the people he's been torturing in his head. And, he, and so, yeah, so Fallon has to treat him and what have you. Um, but as he's going to see Fallon, he walks past one of the people he's been, been torturing. Uh, who gets out of his bed because he's so scared that he's going to get picked up again and goes and uh, hides in a cupboard. Um, and Frank Fallon comes out of all of his stories to try to show that um, these uh, mental disorders are rooted in a society uh, uh, going through a massive struggle against colonialism. 
Okay, to finish, um, I've had dealt with everyone's questions. I hope I have. Uh, we have the, the mixed uh, marriage for one, um, but he did, he, his uh, partner was white. Um, so I was trying to say at the, at the beginning, I don't think he was taking a moral stand or was it against mixed marriages. And I think maybe you're intimating that uh, lots of the leaders, black leaders did end up in uh, mixed relationships. Why is that? Well, maybe it is a reflection of racism in society. Who knows? But um, the truth is, that's all you could also argue, it's a reflection of people breaking out of uh, the, the confines of what they say we should like, or what they say we should be, uh, is the other way to look at it, is the way I prefer to look at it anyway. Um, therefore, we're in favour of getting rid of laws in South Africa, or in laws as they existed up until the 1970s in the United States of America, the so-called land of the free, where big world or no mixed relationships were not allowed. Um, and um, to finish, we should remember uh, the hidden history, and Fanon helps to bring that out, but the hidden history of uh, the working class itself. So I think Fanon is actually a rebuttal to the white privilege nonsense that we get from what's well, the universities that we get in the, in the movement today, which is somehow that white people can't be part of the struggle because they're all equally privileged by racism. This is just simply doesn't accord with history. Uh, so if you look at how uh, 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 Slavery was overcome. It wasn't overcome by Wilberforce doing his business in Parliament. It was overcome by the backbone of the abolitionist movement in this country being the working class militants who understood the connection between chattel slavery and wage slavery. It was overcome. The Civil War in America was partly won with the help of the working class of Manchester who actually, despite the fact they relied on the cotton mills for their employment, were quite happy to boycott those cotton mills in order to destroy the Confederacy and to destroy the slave power in America. Um, throughout the whole history of the development of the working people, working class organisation in Britain has been at its centre the fight against racism. That's why it was no accident that the leaders of the Chartists were black, the man in this city was a black man, and, and they were Irish. Um, they're the first workers' movement anywhere in the world. Uh, that's a necessity for working class people, and not in the same way as the peasantry or the lumping proletarians. Proletariat, which is you know, people who have got no jobs and they don't like to carry out what have you these days, but for people who are, are at work and have to come together in order to win against the boss. Therefore you have to unite with women, therefore you have to unite with gay people, therefore you have to unite with black people in order to win. And it's through that process that people's ideas change, it's dialectical, it's through the process of struggle but people begin to see things for, them for themselves and understand that not all white people are racist, but there's a way of understanding where racism comes from and it's not always existed and it grew up out of capitalist society of a means of justifying racism. Um, Fallon had a, group, a very good grip on that and he hated bullshit which, and he wanted to see a, a fight for real universal um, humanism which is what I call socialism and it's what he calls socialism also and I think we can get there comrades but it requires people that understand our history and understand what works and what doesn't to get together in an organisation, a party and actually to put that into practice all of us together and that's what we try to do in the Socialist Workers Party that's why people complain about our placards being at everything not because we don't, that's because we build those struggles we don't come from the outside and put our placards there actually we build the Grenfell Fell struggle we build those marches for a reason because we think that actually the way that society changes is through the actions of us it's the self-activity of the working class it's the, it's the emancipation of the working class is the act of the working class not of Russian tanks not of peasant armies not of guerrilla struggles not of the Red Army faction in Germany in the 1970s that grew out of the student movement or the Red Brigades in Italy that, that destroyed the revolutionary left by giving the state an excuse to smash us uh, those are bad ideas bad tactics we've got to learn those lessons the way forward is actually destroying their system by using our economic power that's what destroys their monopoly of violence, the fact that the policeman is allowed to beat us over the head quite legally, actually we can neutralise their state with our massive economic and social power as a class. And the question of violence is incidental to that. There will have to be some, and there will have to be an insurrection to get rid of their state, full stop, which would be slightly violent, I'd imagine. Uh, but uh, these things are incidental. The key question is actually mobilising our side, and in that battle, Fallon is actually a tool. So thanks, comrades.